All right, you guys all got that? There's a little med uh, meeting that's being recorded. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, it records everything. So keep that in mind. So be aware. Thanks, guys. Okay. So when we left off last time, uh, we were talking about how do we classify things. And one of the last pieces that we were dealing with was how do we classify our organisms based on their genome. And we had told you that the positive sense meant that we were using a standard double-stranded DNA that went up until a single-stranded RNA that ultimately turned into a functional piece of protein. Oops, put it right over there. And that was your positive direction, right? Now, what needed to happen afterward is to understand the negative sense, which really what it meant is that we were dealing with a complementary sense of the RNA. In other words, I'm trying to look at this guy over here. This guy was still like your RNA, but technically it could not produce any protein. However, that same copy could produce other versions of RNA and then each one of those because it's maximized now it could produce protein a little bit faster than just one at a time so that's kind of where we were ending off last time right okay so now moving on with that the next category that we want to look at is what type of hosts uh, can be infected by viruses. And here's an interesting piece is the fact that as our second way to classify viruses, technically all three domains can be infected. There's no organism on this planet that we know that can't be infected by a virus, which leads us to believe that these guys have been around much longer than we anticipated. But it's really kind of an interesting way in how the virion gets in. My little metaphor, if you will, is that in order for a virion and a host to actually come to contact, they kind of need something like a handshake, right? The idea is that a protein outside the virus and a protein outside the host need to be compatible. Now, understand that this is kind of an important concept in terms of infection. We'll get to infection during the epidemiology lecture. But really what happens is in order for a virus to really take you down, if you want to think about it that way, it has to get in and not only has to get in, it has to attach, it has to get inside the host take over and then eventually kill it. Just because it gets onto you, like for example, somebody comes up to you and sneezes in your face, doesn't mean you're gonna be automatically sick. And so this is one of those key factors that we need to talk about. And especially now that we're talking about a little bit about that whole uh, COVID-19 disease, is the fact that in order for you to truly undergo that disease, is that that virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that we'll talk about a little bit later, has to handshake the host. It has to come into contact, attach itself to the host, and then ultimately get in. Just because it falls on your skin or on your face or anything like that doesn't mean you're going to get sick and doesn't mean you have the disease either. So this kind of handshake is one of the more important pieces. And it is a direct protein-to-protein -protein contact. And probably as you start hearing a little bit more in the news um, about how the virus kind of attacks and enters and so on and so forth, you'll hear these proteins, these um, external proteins that are part of the virus capsid that are responsible for the disease. One of them is called the S protein. You'll hear this uh, throughout some of the topics too. So what ultimately happens is that that virus, after some random collision, finds the matching uh, protein to its host and it holds on to itself. And then that will ultimately allows the entry of the virus into the host. Now, keep in mind for our lecture, you do not need to know the names. Understand this, okay? So remember, we don't make you memorize names. But I did wanna kind of give you an idea of what type of host range these organisms can have. And it's not that only one virus exists for only one organism. As a matter of fact, most of these viruses can kind of jump across multiple types of genera, uh, orders, and classes, uh, not classes, sorry, families and things like that. So for example, just one of the ones that you have on your screen, uh, the Bunyaviridae happens to be able to infect both animals and plants, okay? So this is in terms of, Raj, we call that term spillover, a term that you probably will hear 
uh, eventually too. But it's not just restricted to one particular type of organism, like only dogs per se. So these organisms can jump across. Don't memorize the names, just kind of giving you some examples. Now, ultimately, what we're looking for is that kind of typical handshake that I'm talking about. And you're seeing this in this chart, and so I'm trying to highlight it a little bit more. These proteins outside of them are what deal that little handshake. You guys can see the writing, correct? Yes. Okay. So the idea is that that comes into contact with some sort of host, which is what you're seeing on the right hand side. And so when those two come into contact, then the process of internalizing that virion, that's what end up, ends up happening. So they need that physical contact. All right. So now we looked at one, we looked at specifically its genome. Two, we looked at, you know, the host and how's it, how does it get into the host? The last one we're gonna deal with, part three, yes, I made it Roman just to differentiate it, um, was the shape. And what are we talking about here is one, remember that it's size that makes a difference, right? So clearly the viruses are significantly smaller, even though there are these so-called giant viruses that can um, almost reach the scale of certain cells. But more than anything else, it's the shape of the actual particle of the virus, the virion that we're talking about, the external side, this guy right here, that actually allows it to be classified too. So for example, the outside version of what you're seeing here and this guy that I'm circling is called a polyhedral virus. So it looks like a cool little, um, uh, what is it called? A uh, 20-sided die, if you will. And what happens here is the way that this is assembled is that it's tons and tons of repetitive units. If I can make sure I can write over here, repetitive units of the exact same piece. And so that repetitive unit is usually made out of protein and that piece is called a capsomere. So remember when we were talking the, about the chemistry lecture and we mentioned a little bit about um, dehydration synthesis and assembling things from monomers to polymers, this is a very similar situation and what you can take one piece, I'm drawing that out there, and you can make tons and tons of it. And then ultimately those pieces can all assemble into a larger structure. In this case, it's assembling itself into an enclosure, into the encasing of the virion itself. And so within it, then you'll have your nucleic acid hiding inside. So sometimes it can be just one single one, sometimes it can be a couple of them, two or three sometimes, but ultimately what that entire thing is called when you put it together and you change the color, is called a capsid. So you get capsomeres, which are repetitive units, and then they all assemble into this cool structure that we call it a capsid, okay? Now, that capsid functions primarily as the enclosure like a barrier, like we've talked about in cells and things like that too, but it also has a functional portion of it. it. This is the part that allows it to come into contact with other hosts, right? This idea that it's part of the recognition portion of it, that's part of that handshake that we were talking about before. So uh, what you're seeing on the right-hand side is uh, a model, a computer model of it, and I'm just going to kind of circle that repetitive unit going over and over and over, as you can see it. And so part of that, I'm not sure if you can see it on the actual electron micrograph on the top right, you can actually see the little proteins kind of sticking out from it. Now, for those of you who can paying attention also to the current news and talking about the whole uh, COVID-19 piece, you'll hear that term corona, which means crown, in this case is because it has these little spikes hanging on the outside. And it's part of its recognition process too. All right, so what kind of shapes can you make out of these cool little capsomeres and capsids? Um, probably the most common one that we just kind of talked about is this polyhedral one. Like I said, it looks like a little uh, die. Or sometimes it can be called a spherical. Uh, another version of it is called helical. 
which looks like a little tube, like a little can or something like that. And then there's definitely as a phage. And so why? Because the term phage implies that it um, infects bacteria uh, more than anything else. Yeah, I just saw the lag, so I'm gonna slow down for a second really quick. Everybody's still there? Everybody's still with me? Lag, no lag, are we still good? Are we still there? Thumbs. Good, we got thumbs. I'm gonna double check that this is still recording though. Nope, still recording, we're still good to go. All right, keep it up peeps. So I was trying to tell you my favorite story of the shape behind this guy. And this is called binal or also known as a phage. And the reason we use the term phage is because it usually implies that that organism, that virus, sorry, usually infects bacteria. And the shape, as you can see, is the last one. And you kind of see it diagrammed over here below. No joke, it looks like a lunar lander. That's kind of one of my favorite pieces behind that. And this is one of the sources of inspiration for you know drawing out certain structures in engineering too. And now what's really cool about the phage shape is that inside that little kind of what looks like a little cap is where it stores its material. And then the rest of the body of itself is what lands, detects, and actually injects the actual DNA into the host on its own. So it's kind of a really cool function and shape behind it. All right. Now, aside from the capsid, so aside from the protein coat, it actually has an option so certain viruses can have what we call an envelope. And you're going to hear this also as we hear about uh, SARS-CoV-2. The envelope is an additional layer of protection. Now, why this one is also even cooler than anything else is because viruses don't come with this. Viruses instead steal it. And so what normally happens is when the virus is about to release and escape the actual host, it, as it blows the cell up, as it lyses it, the actual pieces of the membrane of the cell, it actually grabs some of it and encloses itself with it. So it wraps itself uh, around or within the actual pieces of the host itself. So why is that a big deal? The best thing I can probably tell you behind that is the concept of a sheep sorry, of a wolf in sheep's clothing. In other words, it can actually hide from the host's defenses. In other words, by making itself look like the host, it prevents the host's immunity from finding it and ultimately targeting it and getting rid of it. So it's a really neat mechanism. But again, it has to take the host. So when it's actually releasing, when it's escaping from uh, its lytic cycle, once it's done killing the cell, it'll take a little piece of it and throw it all around itself, and now it has this so-called envelope. So we usually end up calling the ones that do this, call, or refer to as envelope viruses, and usually the ones that don't, depending on who you ask, it could be just called a non-envelope virus, or sometimes they're called naked viruses, so keep that in mind. So yes, it has a really neat function for protection, but even better, as you're going to see in a moment, remember that your virus, let's just say we just kind of draw up a little chunk of um, DNA in there, and let's just say it has its little enclosure. That's its capsid, right? I'm just gonna kind of draw it out a little bit there. It has a capsid. That's your little virus, fine. But remember, it can actually steal that envelope. And so if it now on the outside have this actual little envelope, everybody still there? I just saw it patch out, so thumbs. Cool. So that envelope, remember, ends up looking like the host. So what is happening here? If this guy looks like the host, and now you have a cell that has the exact same thing, you can't tell these two apart. And so the beauty behind that is because these two guys look the same, one it can actually come closer to it into contact and ultimately fuse with it, can actually merge with it through endocytosis. 
So it's a really neat effect to have that extra layer of protection, cover, and even a way to hide from the system. All right, so just to kind of give you an idea, uh, now we're looking instead of families, we're looking at orders, uh, which type of organisms can infect which type of uh, different orders under taxonomy. And here's some of the examples. And so your book gives you a couple of lists of the double-stranded and single-stranded versions of uh, DNA viruses. And then we have a list of RNA viruses there too. Remember, you don't need to memorize these guys. You don't need to know any names. We'll talk about the examples, but you're not required to memorize any of these. These are just to kind of give you an idea. However, um, trying to see if I can find them somewhere over here. Your retroviruses, for example, we had talked about this uh, not too long ago. This is your uh, viruses that include, for example, HIV. Uh, obviously, uh, if we have it over here, the uh, Khaleesi Viridae ones over here, these are the ones that give uh, some of the versions of the so called moral viruses involving lots of kind of gastrointestinal distress. Um, if I go back, here's our Orthomyxaviridae, which I'm going to talk about in a moment. These are the ones that include the influenza viruses, the ones that cause the classic flus, for example. Those are all included in there, too. All right. So what I want to do here briefly is talk about the reproduction cycle. Now, for those of you who remember, we were looking at anything from your worms to your um, fungi and everything else. We were looking at how does it get in, how does it get out, how does it make more of itself, asexually, sexually, so on and so forth. But ultimately, the virus has a cycle too. But we kind of divide it into two pieces. One is what we call the external portion of its life cycle. And so here, what we're talking about is how it gets transmitted, right? How's it going from one host to another host? And then we have the internal version. And in this case, how it's making more of itself, right? So we're going to look at mostly the internal replication because the outside portion is pretty much what the reason why we're hiding inside our offices and our homes right now. Okay. So five stages that I need you to know. So definitely be familiar with them. They're pretty uh, simple to kind of describe. The first one is one, it has to attach itself to the host. Okay, the second one has to gain entry to it. So it has to go inside the host itself. And then once it gets inside, it needs to kind of hijack the system of the host to make more of itself. And then once it makes its pieces, it needs to assemble. And then ultimately, once it creates more of itself than blow up the, the host so it can exit and then go and infect the new cells. That's more or less the breakdown, okay? We're gonna look at each individual step and I'm gonna pause in the middle to give you a little bit of a story like we normally do in regular class time, just so we can actually give you something more applicable. So let's look at its standard way of infecting. This is what we call a lytic cycle. We're gonna learn this term, lytic or the same term that means lysis, right? Which means that it'll get inside the cell, right? Here, I'm gonna put my little virus over here and crack the thing, right? And then it'll blow up the cell and then turning into lots of little virus particles everywhere else. This is your basic lytic cycle. It's destroying the entire host. All right, so the first portion is literally kind of random. Believe it or not, it's based on the chances of both the virus and the actual host encountering themselves. One of the biggest issues that is kind of going on around right now is, for example, people trying to sell you things like Lysol or uh, saying that things like UV radiation will work on a virus. No, they don't, because when the virus is outside, on a surface or anything like that, technically, like we've described before, it's not really alive. And things like UV radiation and even your substances you can buy don't really kill things that are not replicating. Viruses are not replicating unless they're inside a host. It's really not doing anything. So when it gets dangerous is when the actual um, virus itself encounters the host. That's really when we need to kind of talk about good stuff. So this is usually based on a random encounter. Now, what do I mean by random over here? Understand that somebody that's infected has to pass on that virus onto you. Well, how will they do that? Well, either by some sort of disgusting version of sneezing, coughing, or passing on 
you know, some droplets onto you or through some other type of contact. But just because they do that doesn't mean you're automatically infected. That's just somebody hitting, with, hitting you directly with that virus. In other words, the virus landed on you, but it hasn't gained entry inside your cells. So that just means you got hit. That doesn't mean you're gonna get the disease. Now, once it lands on you, then it has to find the correct host. And remember that it has to find the right one by that weird little handshake that we were describing earlier. In other words, it can be running, let's just say somebody sneezes on you and it hits you in the face, well, that gains access through your mucosal surfaces, eyes, nose, ears, mouth, that kind of thing. That's one way to get an entry to find the right cells, the right hosts. But if somebody sneezes on your toe, for example, not really the right handshake it's looking for. Your classic respiratory viruses need to access your respiratory system. So again, if the virus technically just runs on your toe, it's not really gaining access to it. So it's more than just that random encounter. It has to get in and then ultimately find the right host and do that handshake to get in, okay? So that attachment is the primary piece. Now, again, random collision. And the example that I'm giving you here is the version that occurs in bacteria. So hence the term bacteriophage that you're seeing up here. But I'm just only giving you an example if it were to happen to like E. coli or salmonella or something like that. And so after the random collision, what will happen is, for example, these bacteriophages, those little tail fibers that we we're talking about before, perform that handshake. And so it performs that handshake with the host. And then ultimately what it will do is no joke. It acts like a cool little syringe in which will poke a hole through the actual uh, cell wall and membrane and then inject its little genome. So it's more than just kind of landing on your skin or something like that. Now, I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. So you guys can hang around and ask any questions if you're on to. But one of the things that um, I'm gonna be doing a little bit later is giving a little talk on obviously the virus itself, um, SARS-CoV-2. But I want to take away a little bit from that stigma associated with it, so kind of that panic mode that a lot of people are getting, and just kind of remind you that even though we have, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of cases, and you know, it's percentage of three to five percent death, which I haven't checked recently, uh, remind you that over even just the exact 100 years or so, uh, lots of epidemics have actually occurred, and these are actually deaths, not just cases that have been infected. And so these are deaths in the millions to hundreds of thousands of them. And most of these are due to probably one of the most infamous ones that you all know. And this is called the influenza virus, right? Now, um, one of the biggest uh, issues with dealing with the influenza virus is that it comes in all sorts of cool little variations or technically shapes, if you will. Um, so one of the common questions that people get is, well, why haven't we found a, common, uh, a cure for the common cold? Um, why do I have to get a uh, vaccination every year or you know, yeah, so on and so forth, all these variations. Well, let me tell you why. So, so far we've already told you about its genome or viral genomes. And we tell you that it's enclosed inside this cool little uh, carrier uh, enclosure called a capsid. Now, what you're seeing there is a model of the influenza virus. And so you can see there in the little coil, roughly green over there or grayish color, that's its um, genome. And on the outside, you're seeing two particular colors, a red and a blue color, which are part of its capsid. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, for those of you who are familiar a little bit more with names behind specifically the influenza virus, it usually gets named by using the letters H and letters N. You've heard terms like H1N1, H2N1, H5N4, and so on and so forth. Those H's and N's are talking specifically about the capsid, the outside of the actual virus, the virion. And it's talking about two particular proteins. The H stands for a protein called hemagglutinin, and the N stands for a protein called neuraminidase. So they just kind of get abbreviated by its uh, first letter. And so the virus has both of these sticking on the outside, and it's what makes that virus able to recognize its host and get in. So that's part of the handshake mechanism that I was talking about before. Now, 
what's interesting about this is that, well, if we had this just one virus, as we we're talking about, we probably have already come up with some sort of way to treat it. The fact is, though, is that we've been coming up with vaccines for forever now, and we still keep on getting flus all the time, and it keeps on getting worse and worse, as we are currently going through one of those phases as well, and nothing to do with COVID-19. So why is it that this is the issue? Why is it that we need new vaccines? Why is it that we haven't found a cure or the so-called not so common cold, if you will? It's because of those particular two proteins, the H and the N, and it comes in again in all these variations. Now, the reason behind this is that that protein, or those proteins, I should say, uh, let me kind of draw these out over here, these two bad boys, right, can actually mutate. Well, its DNA can mutate, so I should write that down. Actually, it's RNA, I should correct that. It's RNA can mutate. And so what happens is sometimes that H1 is no longer an H1, it's small little changes in its protein, and it can be called an H2, or an H3, or an H4, and so on and so forth. Tons of different variations behind it. And the same thing applies to the N1. It can be an N1, N2, N3, and so on and so forth. So what happens is, depending on the virus, it can come in all these cool variations. So you can have something like NH5, N3, which technically, even though it's still a flu virus, it's different than the H1 and one version that we want. So what happens? When everybody's talking about a flu season and we're talking about vaccinations, for example, when you get the flu shot, the so-called flu shot, it's usually covering the three to five most kind of either virulent, aggressive, or more dangerous versions of flu going around. Typically per season, there might be 20 to up to sometimes 100 of them going around uh, during that season. And you only get a vaccination, a shot, for the top three or five, because those are the worst ones. But there's still the other you know, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 of them floating around. So just because you get the flu shot doesn't mean you're not going to get sick or not going to get flu. You're just not likely to get the ones you got vaccinated for. The other you know, dozen of them that are out there, you still can get infected. And so you'll always get these reports of, oh, I got the flu shot and I still got the flu. Well, that's why. Because there's more than just one H1N1 out there. Okay? The other reason behind why we continually have these vaccinations and every year there's a season or two, three seasons behind it is because those proteins, like I said, mutate. And so those small little differences make it difficult just for us to create another vaccine. So as long as it's getting inside a host, reproducing and making more copies of itself, as long as it mutates and makes it a little bit different, then the next generation of it will be different, uh, different to treat. Now, um, in terms of uh, the questions behind how the flu shot works, again, top three to top five or so, usually the big, uh, big ones, the worst ones, the ones that might cause a bit of uh, more damage. Um, however, when you're getting the flu shot, you're usually getting either what we call an attenuated version, one that means uh, less virulent or less damaging or less crazy or less hard hitting, whatever term you want to use. So it's a toned down version. That's what literally attenuated means. And so you'll still experience some of the symptoms. In other words, you'll still get a little flu-ish, but just not as bad. Or sometimes we just give you pieces of the virus that we know will elicit your immune system to kind of fight back and then turn on its gear to fight back other versions of the virus as well. So yes, when you get the flu shot, you will still get some of the symptoms some of the time, but it wouldn't be as bad as if you got infected from the virus itself straightforward. In any case, so I just wanted to kind of give you this variation as opposed to what we're all hearing kind of around out there, but the premise is still the same as opposed to everybody talking about the fact that this novel thing going around trying to kill you. No, we've known about the coronaviruses since the 60s, if I remember correctly, I have to double check. And we have uh, seven different strains out there, four different genera uh, that we need to worry about. They're called alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, for example. And only one of them out of there currently is the one we're currently worrying about right now. So this is not something you know that came out of some random lab that was created if you're hearing all the BS that you know people are trying to produce on over social media. 
but it's changing. It's changed from its previous generations. And because of those small variations, one of the ones that was present in animals, in this case, managed to spill over onto humans. And so now it's hitting us. And because we have never encountered it before, we have never experienced it before, our immune system doesn't quite know how to handle it yet. So we're getting hit, we're being attacked. Um, and most of us apparently are going asymptomatic, which makes it a little bit dangerous. Um, but the amount in comparison to, for example, the, the example that I'm giving you up here in terms of the influenza virus and other viruses out there like Ebola and things like that, that can be a much more serious case. So um, I'm trying to read uh, the question over here. I'm still not sure about that confirmation. I remember reading about the whole tiger thing. Um, so I'm trying to kind of stay low on that side until I can actually confirm it from an actual publication rather than just a report. So keep that in mind. Okay, so we'll come back to more of this stuff too. So, um, so let me kind of give you really quick what this guy is. So it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It's a negative sense virus, and it falls under the uh, order of Orthomyxoviridae. So that's the one of the tables that I was kind of showing you that beforehand. But uniquely, it comes with eight pieces of its RNA uh, genome. So as opposed to you know, being just one piece or two pieces, it comes with eight little different segments. Now, something you're asking, uh, why would that uh, be asymptomatic? There's a couple of reasons behind it. Um, just because the virus got into you doesn't mean that it got into your cells. That has to do with a definition called susceptibility. Um, just because you got, uh, it landed on you, somebody sneezed on your face, for example, um, and it's all over your body, if you will, doesn't mean it entered your respiratory cells more than anything else. It didn't enter your lungs. So one, you're not going to expose any symptoms. Now, the other piece is really just the fact that your build in terms of your genetics and your immune system are better off than other people. So you will experience a much lighter version of those, um, the symptoms that other uh, people would feel. And keep in mind also, age has to play a role. Your genetics have to play a role. Location plays a role in terms of the world. So some people will experience it different than others. This is why our biggest concern is usually based on children, which again, haven't really been exposed to a lot, and usually the elderly population, which already their immune system is kind of weakened, and so they can get hit much harder. That doesn't mean you can't either. Um, it just that it means that everybody will experience those sets of uh, signs and symptoms are a little bit more different. Also keep in mind again that you are different than everybody else and this can be from your diet to where you live and so on and so forth. All right, so going back to what we're talking about, the five stages, remember the first one, it has to find you. Now once it finds you, again, doesn't mean you're going to die. It doesn't mean it's going to kill you. It just found you, but it hasn't gone in, gotten into your whole cells. So to step two, plays a critical role, it has to gain entry. It has to get inside the cell itself. Now, again, that doesn't mean anything else either. It can gain entry, just like I was showing you over here, the bacteriophage kind of injects its genome into that. Now, one of the ways it does that is by poking holes and it uses this cool little enzyme called lysozyme, which is meant to kind of dissolve the cell wall and the cell membrane so that it can get in. That's one of the really neat aspects behind the viruses that can do that. Now, again, remember, there's differences between the ones that are bacterial versus the ones that are eukaryotic, for example. Even though there's still roughly some similar scales, remember that our cells, for example, are much larger. And for a small variation, for example, like humans, we don't have a wall. Whereas bacteria, when we have gram positives and gram negatives, do have them. So they have extra layers to fight through. So there's that variation between both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. There's also a variation in the fact that the actual virion can come naked or enveloped, which again, that whole wolf and sheep's clothing concept, right? And so if uh, one of the ways that it can get in is what we call direct penetration, Either naked viruses can actually do the handshake and get in, or some of them can actually poke holes that uh, lysozyme that we we're talking about to get in. A different version behind it is for those that are enveloped, the ones that are already kind of coated with the same looks as the host, they just fuse with the membrane. 
So because they look alike and they're made up of the same lipids or roughly the same lipid composition, the two membrane layers interact and then one kind of becomes part of the other. And then the last version behind this is through the cell endocytosing. So either thinking that it was food or thinking that it's gonna kill it and it can't, or by triggering some sort of uh, internalization mechanism. So here's all three kind of versions that I'm showing you here. On the top left is by either uh, that handshake that we're talking about and then uh, internalizing its genome and then getting in, or if it has an envelope, like these guys over here, right? Since it matches what's part of the actual host itself, they can just kind of fuse together and then get through. Or otherwise, the third version I was telling you is the order handle over that, that side. Remember what we talked about in terms of two ways of getting things in through endocytosis, so pinocytosis and phagocytosis, those are those versions as well. Now, as far as a uh, question, which is a very valid question, Angel, is this idea of are they easier to kill? Now, you highlighted in quotations the term kill, because again, technically by most definitions, they're not really alive, but if it has an envelope and that's its method of protection, removing that, uh, that envelope will prevent it from being able to get in. So this whole kind of craze that went on for the fact that everybody's you know, buying out antibacterials, remember that, uh, sorry, antimicrobial uh, substances, not necessarily antibacterials, is that people kept on buying these stupid little packages and like, just putting on their hands and all over the place with really not much benefit. One of the key features behind that is that most of those are just directed at killing 99.9% .9 of your bacteria. That's fine, but this is not a bacterium, this is a virus. However, when they have this envelope, remember that that envelope is lipids, just like ours, just like our cells. And so if some of those antimicrobial solutions had alcohol in them, alcohol disrupts lipids. It separates out the lipids. And so if these viruses were enveloped, but in other words, not naked, yeah, it would prevent their transmission. But only again, if it contained alcohol and usually between a 50 to 70% uh, concentration is what helps the most. Again, it doesn't kill it, but it does remove its, um, its envelope, which then removes its ability to be pathogenic. But again, it doesn't really necessarily mean it's gonna kill anything. And so most people went a little bit too crazy behind using this and trying to kind of put antibacterial solutions over everything, which again, not a lot of benefit behind that. All right, so if it can gain entry, again, doesn't mean you're gonna die. It ne then needs to actually hijack the actual host itself. How will it do that? Well, what it will do normally is that it starts stealing away all its metabolic processes. In other words, it makes the host, all its, um, for example, its ribosomes, its polymerases and everything else will work for the virus as opposed to the host itself. So it kind of hijacks them. Uh, the usual kind of silly example that I give people here is for example, let's just say that, you know, in the middle of the night, you went to sleep, so you're sleeping, and then somebody else comes into your house and use your washer, eats your food and everything else, and just kind of uses everything about you and then just leaves, right? So that's more or less what a virus is really doing. It gets inside the host and it starts using all its machinery. And it uses its machinery, it takes advantage of it so it can make more of itself. The problem with it is that just like anything else that has been used, while something else is using it, nothing else can use it either. So what is happening is the fact that if somebody's already using your washer, you can't wash. If somebody using your toaster, nobody else can use it and make toast. So the same premise applies. These viruses take away their polymerases, take away their ribosomes, take away other pieces, and therefore the cell can't do its job. So the cell kind of pauses and ultimately dies because it can't you know, continue to do its own metabolic processes. And all in the meanwhile, the virus is making more of itself. It's using its genome, its proteins to make more of itself. And then once it makes all the parts that it needs, it assembles. And so you're seeing a little uh, kind of diagram of the assembly, uh, assembly of the pieces of a bacteriophage, of the ones that infect uh, bacteria. Now, the problem with this is that that assembly process, even though it looks a little bit on the complex side, believe it or not, we really don't know how that's done. We don't have enough information to understand how the virus is going to be assembled. That's something that is at the 
frontier research of virology. So partially because one, remember viruses are already way smaller than they usually are, so it makes it very difficult to track. Two, the reproduction is extremely fast, and we'll show you uh, burst time in a moment. But then three, you know, trying to study viruses like animal viruses, we need an animal host to do so. Unless you guys are going to volunteer to be infected by viruses so we can study this, it takes a little bit more time than usual. Now, let's make sure that we can again cover what's it going to do inside. So once it gains entry, so once it injects its genome where it gets eaten by the cell, it kind of hijacks everything and it uses its own blueprint, its own RNA or its own DNA as a template to make more of itself. And then it starts making its own proteins to kind of take over the system and then make uh, pieces of itself part of its capsid. So it's capsid and to make more of itself. Now, the differences are here is kind of interesting. When you're looking at a, a virus that infects a eukaryotic cell versus a prokaryotic cell, there's an inherent difference. Remember the eukaryotes have a nucleus. So we have an extra little barrier on the inside of our cells as opposed to E. coli, in which their um, genome is usually kind of flowing around that nuclear region that we talked about. So when certain viruses need to hijack certain systems, we kind of have to on a, um, go through some of these extra um, barriers or differences. <clears throat> One of the bigger differences is again, we don't have a cell wall. So we're kind of a little bit more exposed. Bacteria, whether gram positive or gram negative, already have as part of their envelope, an extra layer of peptidoglycan and sometimes even a second membrane in the case of our gram negatives. So there's small differences between us uh, and, and between the domains that make our viruses need to be adaptive towards those particular types of hosts. And so, um, once they again get in, remember, depending on which type of genome it has, if it's double-stranded DNA, for example, it could proceed in the positive sense. If it's positive uh, sense single-stranded RNA, it can just make proteins immediately from that, which is what you're seeing on the left-hand side. But if it's negative strand, uh, negative sense, sorry, single-stranded RNA, remember it needs to make a positive copy of it, it's complement to it, and then it can make uh, proteins from it. But the other cool thing it can do is that it can make more copies of the negative sense as a template, or probably the worst combo that we can have is when we have a double strand of uh, RNA, which you're seeing on the right-hand side, is that those two strands can then separate. The positive strand can make proteins, and the negative strand can make more copies of the positive strand itself. So these guys can, are relatively well adapted to be able to kind of hijack our system and make uh, more copies of itself which is where we enter uh, the portion of its reproduction in more detail. Remember, we're looking at this lytic cycle, its ability to get in and build things up. Well, normally when it gets in, hijacks, and then gets to release, the amount of time that it takes from point A to point B, so entry and then leaving, is called burst time. And the burst time, believe it or not, can be you know, as little as about 20 minutes Okay, and so within those 20 minutes, um, it will make anywhere between 10 to 100 to even a thousand different uh, new virus particles. And so the amount of it is usually called the burst size. Okay, so now understand that if you can make a thousand viruses in 20 minutes, after 40 minutes, it's second burst time, it'll make a million of itself. And after one hour, so another 20 minutes, it'll be a billion. So this is a significantly higher rate of uh, reproduction and making more copies of itself. That's what we call burst time. And then the quantity, which is you're seeing on the lower left, is called burst size. <clears throat> now, Shannon, you were asking in terms of uh, does only the negative RNA replicate? Uh, technically, any of its versions can do so. So whether it's double-stranded DNA, double-stranded RNA, or single-stranded of either of them too, should be able to make more of themselves too so that they can make more virus particles. <clears throat> All right. So in terms of uh, getting rid of things, I remember, although this is probably just by experience more than anything else, is that your typical bacterium is much easier to kill simply because the fact one, we can send it a little bit better, but we have plenty of drugs out there to deal with and we understand how it reproduces. Whereas a virus, again, much smaller, much more restricted in terms of its composition, 
And again, as we're starting to understand its type of genome, a little bit more challenges to go after. So I definitely vote for easier to kill will be your bacteria. All right, so now we told you all that story just so we can go through this one. And this is what we started off last week. For those of you who remember, I gave you a brief introduction when we are talking about uh, HPV and cancer. So let me tell you why we're going into this aspect. So this is a modification of what they normally do. In other words, normally your virus finds its host, gets inside, hijacks, makes more of itself, blows up and leaves, done, killing that host. Again, that's the burst time and burst size. But every now and then it actually changes. Rather than getting in, hijacking, and then blowing up the host, it stays. And so this is a process in bacteria called lysogeny. Okay, so remember the original term when we're talking about just get in and blow up is called lytic. But sometimes it chooses to stay. So that's what you're kind of seeing in the right hand side. So you have a version of it called the lytic cycle, which is what I'm circling over there. And sometimes instead of doing that, it can go into something called the lysogenic cycle or lysogeny. Now again, we're only talking about viruses right now. We'll talk about humans in a moment. I'm sorry, bacteria right now. So every now and then, after it gets in, host entry, in this case, instead of doing the whole hijacking and blowing the guy up, it stops. There is no synthesis. It doesn't hijack the system. Instead, what this is really neat, it incorporates, it incorporates itself into the host, a term that we call a prophage. Remember the term phage means it's part of bacteria. And what this really means is that it kind of goes inactive for a little while. In other words, all the stuff that the virus should be doing inside gets suppressed, gets turned down, turned off for a little bit. And it becomes part or it integrates itself into the genome. Now, there's two big issues with this that I'm gonna talk about and then we're talking about uh, what happens in humans or other animals. I want you to understand this and so I'm gonna introduce just a quick slide over here. So I'm gonna draw this out. <clears throat> let's just say, let's get this guy. That's correct, Sarah. That's exactly what happens with the incorporation of something going uh, lysogenic. So let me kind of show you how that works. So you have your awesome little DNA, right? Everybody's familiar with that little piece. And for, for today, I'm just gonna color the DNA of the virus in purple. So let's just talk about a tiny little chunk of, let's say, double-stranded DNA from the virus. Now, normally that virus, that little purple thing that we're showing over there, will get in, hijack the cell, take over, blow it up, and do it, make more of itself. However, sometimes what it will do is instead of doing that, it'll actually merge itself into the genome of the host and become part of it. And so what happens is, let me try and do all this out. I'm gonna make this a little bit longer just so I kind of see it. Its genome becomes incorporated I'm going to draw it just here in the middle. Its strand becomes part of the host. It just kind of injects itself into it. Now, while it's part of its host, or the host in this case, it's not doing anything. It just goes dormant. It goes to sleep. So it's not really taking over, not hijacking. It's not running the system, and it's not killing the cell. Now, what's the danger with this? Well, there's two big dangerous pieces behind this when it goes lysogenic. One of them is, I'm going to kind of, draw a little bit of a cell around this guy. Let's just pretend that this is a little E. coli over here. So let's just pretend that. Technically, the DNA should be circular, but work with me here. Okay, so what would normally happen is since it's part of its DNA now, whenever this E. coli replicates and makes two of itself, and those two make four, and four make eight, and 16, and so on and so forth, each time it replicates, it also copies the virus at the same time. So what happens? While it's dormant, while it's inactive, while it's doing so, let's just say your little E. coli you know, replicates a couple of hundred times. 
So now you've made, you know, a couple of million bacteria, okay? And each one of those million bacteria has that virus inside of it. And then just at the right time, that virus gets induced. And this could be quantity, could be availability of food for the cell, the cell might be dying, other lots of triggers. And now you've just made a million viruses all come out at the same time. Except that now they're hijacking the machine. And remember that each one of them can make a thousand copies of themselves. And so just in one giant burst, they've made a billion of them in one shot. So what, that's one of the bigger dangers behind it. And so Sarah, you were asking, this is what happens with certain types of viruses. Yes, so certain variations specific, and specifically for uh, herpes viruses is that they can become part of the system and then you won't display any symptoms, nothing as a host until much, much later in life. How long that can be anywhere between six months to a decade sometimes and even longer. So that's one of the dangers. It kind of, kind of lies hidden. But the second danger, sometimes they just get stuck and never leave. Okay. Now, what's the danger behind that? Well, if it never leaves, this new little piece that got integrated now just added a new superpower to the cell. Whatever those particular um, proteins that were part of that virus are now part of that bacterium. And so that bacterium can now become more dangerous, become more virulent. Um, is it possible that it's dormant? As of this moment, since humans are known not to have them, no, it's not likely. But that it can become dormant, yeah, it's possible, but we don't know enough about it yet to say that that's what's gonna happen with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in case you're wondering. Now, that's in terms of a virus, uh, sorry, a bacterium. This is what happens when we go have a bacterium go lysogenic. Now, the story that I wanted to tell you in the first place is what happens in a eukaryote? What if it does the same thing in humans or dogs or cats or whatever you want to measure? Well, pretty much in, in terms of eukaryotes, it's the same concept. With the one small exception is that, remember that we don't have a wall as opposed to plants and fungi that do. And so these viruses, especially the ones that have envelopes, hide really well because they look like us, again, wolf in sheep's clothing. And specifically, only the ones that usually have a double-stranded DNA or that can create double-stranded DNA can turn it into this uh, new cycle. And so for us, we call it a different name. So everything has a lytic cycle, just like uh, bacteria do. But the incorporation for us, this is called latency. So we use the term lysogenic in bacteria. Area, but we use the term latent in terms of humans and other eukaryotes. That means the exact same thing, just so you know, okay? It's just a different organism that is the host. And so when it's inside a bacterium and it gets incorporated, we call that a prophage. And when it's inside eukaryotes, we call it a provirus. They mean the same thing, just uh, different hosts and different uh, viruses doing so. So now, what's the big deal when that happens in us? So now let's go back to the very beginning of what we talked about in terms of viruses. What happens when it goes latent in humans? Well, then let me give you briefly the same type of uh, drawing that I gave you a little bit earlier. We have our DNA. What if this little chunk of its genome gets incorporated part of us? All right, what could happen there? Well, I want you to kind of think about this a little, a little more in depth. If we look at this uh, protein, for example, I'm trying to get this. If we're supposed to produce a piece of RNA from this guy, just lost the screen, there it goes. Thumbs up to check that everybody's still up there. Are we still seeing stuff? Cool, okay. It looks like it paused, so 
and then ultimately that's supposed to produce a protein. Good. What happens if literally in the middle of your sequence of your gene, you throw a different chunk of DNA? So think about it this way. Remember when we were talking about mutation during the central dogma lecture? Any type of mutation usually is fairly disruptive and sometimes even lethal. So now you just threw a giant chunk of it in the middle of its uh, blueprint. So that means typically, not always, typically your RNA is going to be useless and therefore you're not going to be able to produce a useful protein. That's the most simplest of those answers. But that's not really where I was going with this. Really what I want to go with is what happens when it goes into the wrong spot. And what I mean by that is this. For those of you who remember, let's kind of draw this out really quick. Here's our little double-stranded piece of DNA. And remember that in order to make RNA, you need to find two sequences to help you out, one at the beginning, one at the end. One of them was called the promoter, and one of them was called the terminator. Okay. Uh, that's the interesting question behind that, Angel, is that it typically is random, but since it's a piece of DNA, uh, most of the time it has certain affinities to certain regions too. So it does have places that are more likely to hit. And this is the example that I'm about to give. Sometimes when these guys go latent, what happens if instead of just going somewhere random completely, it gets into a spot that is in charge of control? So for example, the promoter. What do I mean by this? So remember that you need the promoter to start transcription. So with no transcription, you can't get translation, no protein, right? But what if it gets at the place that you control all of it? Well, if the most basic piece is just like the example I gave you earlier, everything is shot, nothing works anymore. But what if it gets in the way and deactivates something? And what I mean by something more than anything else, what if it deactivates, or in turn even makes worse, something that controls cell growth. In other words, it gets inserted into a piece that is in charge of cell division. Remember, your cell division is highly regulated. You guys should have learned that at AMP when you dealt with mitosis and meiosis, that whole cell cycle piece, right? Now, what if this guy inserts itself right at that spot which controls that? Well, now what will happen is that you'll have unregulated or dysregulated growth, which means that either the protein that is supposed to be in charge of making it grow just keeps on making more and more and more, which then means you'll start making more and more growth, which means more uncontrolled growth for the cells, which just like you confirmed, Sarah, cancer. Or what if it gets in the way of something that is in charge of stopping the cell cycle? In other words, a signal that says, oh, cell, please don't grow anymore, and it ruins that one. Well, now the stopping signal is gone, and so now the cell division will never stop. And again, cancer. So go back to the beginning of this topic when we're talking about something like HPV. The human papilloma virus specifically does exactly that. It has a very high affinity for integrating itself into these control regions. And so in terms of triggering cancer, what a field we call oncogenesis, is that sometimes these viruses can get integrated, they can go latent in places that are in charge of cell growth. Usually we call these oncogenes or sometimes we call them proto-oncogenes as we say that these are the ones in charge of growth. And so these oncogenes or proto-oncogenes get disrupted, so if you, do this, you mess with them, and now they continuously make RNA, lots and lots and lots, to the point that now you can't stop it. So something like the human papilloma virus, when it goes latent and it disrupts cell control systems, it can lead towards cancer. And so um, unfortunately, no, it, it would be nice and simple if all cervical cancers were caused by HPV, but it is definitely the leading cause. So remember what happens in an area like the cervix, for example, it is an area of high growth lots of cell division, again, roughly uh, on a monthly cycle. Now you integrate a virus that just gets in there, disrupts that cell growth. Now that's gonna grow even more and more and more, triggering a high likelihood of cancer and then other clearly uh, more lethal type of effects. So 
um, in terms of knowing, we do know that there's areas of uh, more possibility of integrating itself in there, uh, but there's no perfect answer to that, to be honest. So, but this applies to virtually any cell and any virus integrating itself into its cell growth routine. So yes, it can trigger cancer in virtually anything, as long as it can go latent or in terms of bacteria, um, lysogenic. They both mean pretty much the same thing. All right. <clears throat> Just to kind of close off the last few minutes, um, we need to address how do things kind of grow. And keep in mind that these are viruses, which means these are parasites. And that means we need something to grow, uh, for it to grow in. In other words, we need a host. And since it's unlikely that any of you guys are going to volunteer to grow some, you know, SARS-CoV-2 uh, over there in you guys, we need other models. More likely than not, one of the most common ways is, for example, to use uh, bacterial lawns for bacterial phages. So we can use like a little colony of E. coli and then let uh, bacterial viruses grow in those. That's pretty simple. But what about in eukaryotes? What about something like you? Well, what we actually found out is that we can actually use eggs embryonated eggs, meaning fertilized eggs, not the same ones you buy at the store, okay? And different areas of the tissue can serve as locations for us to introduce the virus and the virus can grow from there. And because they're tiny, we can actually have hundreds if not thousands of these guys in little racks of eggs, no joke, as a way to kind of grow our own viruses. And then the last version of it is in terms of tissue culture, is cell culture, in which we can take cell lines that have been immortalized, typically, some cells that used to be or have a possibility of being cancerous, and we grow these in petri plates just like you would do in the lab. And so we can infect those with the viruses that are ready to grow them too. But there's other ways to do so, unless you want to volunteer grandma, you can let me know for that one. All right. So, last little piece, the last couple of minutes, and then we'll um, take a break. That's correct, and I don't So, the concept behind HeLa cells and Henrietta Lacks is part of one of those immortalized cell lines. Good book and a good story too. Um, aside from viruses, believe it or not, there's a smaller version of viruses that exist even now, and these are called viroids. So if you thought viruses were tiny, viroids are even smaller. Viroids not only do not have any protein outside of them, so they do not have a capsid, so they're flat out naked little pieces of RNA. Um, they're usually circular, and again, much smaller than uh, your classic virus. And so these are all infectious. Good news though, they seem to be only be found in plants. If you haven't found them in humans yet or in animals, that doesn't mean it's not possible. And even better, we found these in fungi too. These are called viroid-like agents. So there are uh, agents that can be much smaller than viruses. There are also infectious and they can also be disrupted. Lots of the diseases that you see sometimes in plants when you see the Leaves, for example, being eaten by certain uh, pieces, those are usually viroids. Now, the last piece, last, last, last completely here, are prions. Probably one of my favorite stories also, simply because nobody saw this one coming. So in the early 80s, so late 70s, uh, we started seeing certain diseases um, that most of you are familiar with and now know as things like man cows disease. These are known as the transmissible splendid form encephalopathies. And the um, group and lab that was working on it by then, uh, the name of the uh, principal investigator, the name of Stanley Krusner, um, proposed that because we couldn't identify a virus, a bacterium, or anything like that, that it was very possible that it was a protein that was doing this. And so he proposed a name called a prion. Okay. Now, the sad thing about this is it took him a good decade to actually demonstrate this, and pretty much he was kind of disbarred from all accounts of science. Everybody laughed at him. Everybody made fun of him. Everybody told him he was crazy, him and his lab, obviously. And then later on, we found out that he was right. And so he got the Nobel Prize for that one, so a little bit more vindicated behind that. But his proposal was very interesting. He proposed that proteins by themselves could infect other proteins. So I want you to understand the the scale of this. We're not talking about a parasite. We're not talking about a worm. We're not talking about a bacterium. We're not even talking about a virus. We're talking about the smallest scale of functionality, a protein, to be able to go and look at another protein, and change it. And that's one of the coolest things you can talk about. And so usually the way that I kind of 
relate this to most people. It's talking about who you hang out with. I'm sure at some point in time, out of all of your friends, there's usually that one bad one, that you know, rotten apple, and that person, the one that everybody tells you you shouldn't hang out with them. And if nobody's telling you that, it's you typically. Um, it's the, the one that kind of makes everybody else go bad. And so proteins, these prions can actually change other proteins and turn them to go bad. In other words, a protein is corrupting another protein. So it's like your friends are corrupting you, All right? Now, what's weird about this is that what they're doing is changing their shape. Now, what's the issue here? If remember, proteins are all about three-dimensional shape. It's all about their uh, uh, three-dimensional volume and how they perform their functions. If you change the shape, you change the function, but then you leave the nature in them. So if you already have a bad protein per se, a corrupt protein, and it's now, it's now misshaping other uh, proteins, ultimately have this weird uh, little domino effect that in specifically in this group of proteins called prions, happens to hit the brain. And so what happens is when they're all corrupted per se, um, they end up leaving holes in your brain, the so-called kind of what looks like a little, some of one inside your brain just start poking holes in it, like a little piece of cheese. And so by leaving holes in your brain, obviously you start going a little crazy. And so enter the terms that you've all heard as mad cow disease. And that has a story that kind of went crazy also in the 80s and ultimately changed some marketing in terms of cows, is that we've actually detected this early on in sheep when it started, a disease called scraping, in which sheep started acting a little weird. And what they would do is they would run into walls and run into fences and specifically run into uh, barbed wire and scrape themselves off. And so the disease was called scrapey, but nobody could figure out why. So most uh, farmers, most uh, owners, they said, all right, well, crazy sheep, we'll kill it, grind it up, and feed it to the other sheep. You know, not waste food. But we found out that these proteins, because they're proteins, um, they don't necessarily um, get completely destroyed. And more than anything else, they happen to be heat resistant. So even if you cook them, they don't um, get destroyed. So no offer, they're not actually cannibals, but we're the humans that force them to eat them so because we don't want to waste. Um, and so what happened is those sheep that would eat the same ones that were going crazy would also go crazy. So it became a little chain. And ultimately, since we went kind of crazy with sheep, we kind of killed all those sheep and fed it to cows. And then the cows eventually started getting that protein and enter mad cow disease. So kind of a fun domino effect. Now, ultimately, we ate those cows same way. People started demonstrating that effect. The last piece here is that we've known this because there seems to be some sort of genetic predisposition. Uh, the idea here is that it looks like certain people and certain proteins in their brain are more likely to acquire this than others. We know this because we've studied certain groups, specifically Aboriginal groups, in which they're cannibalistic. And I know somebody was asking about this a little bit earlier too is that in certain tribes, whenever they would, you know, uh, win certain tribal warfare, they would kill their uh, enemies and then chop them up into little pieces and consume them. And then eventually those guys also started going a little crazy. Now, in particular, for some reason, brains happen to be one of those delicacies. And so they would consume the brain, consuming the bad protein, the corrupt protein. And those people eventually over time would also go a little crazy. So we know that this actually happens outside just mad cows, if you will. Anyway, that's pretty much the story that I want to kind of uh, give you guys with in terms of uh, 